Welcome. My name is Brenna. I work for PRLT, Presumpscot Regional Land Trust. Um, I'm their community engagement manager. This is our second year doing the walks with GMRI. It's wonderful. Um, and the fish are migrating, which is awesome. We're at the Perry Court Trailhead, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna hike down the hill, and then we're gonna cross this lovely bridge, and we're gonna hike up to the southern viewing pool. And it's about around a mile, probably just a little bit under. It's pretty hilly, steep terrain. If we're lucky, we get to see fish migrating as we walk in schools as they make their way through snags in the water. Presumpscot Regional Land Trust is a community conservation-led nonprofit organization. Our regional land trust, the five towns in our service area are Gorham, Gray, Standish, Westbrook, and Wyndham. And those five towns make up the majority of the lower Presumpscot River watershed. Within that area, we work to conserve and steward local lands and waters of all varieties. AOIs are a really unique species. They used to be a little bit less unique. They really declined partially due to habitat loss and then in a really big way due to barriers like dams. So everywhere that alewives have returned to has basically been a result of some sort of restoration effort and Millbrook is no different. The Smelt Hill Dam previously blocked passage for about 250 years. That and other dams like it. That was removed in the mid 90s. Alewives exist a lot of places. These restoration efforts have been successful and some places they never went away. There aren't very many places that you can see them in their natural surroundings. There are lots of fishways where you can see the alewives in mass, but here we're lucky to have two viewing pools where you can see them from right next to the trail and really get up close and personal with the National Geographic type of drama of the fish climbing the ladder. Be sure to look at the river as we walk and think about it. Unlike salmon that jump, alewives can't jump. So you're gonna see a bunch of blowdowns, a bunch of trees in the water, low water conditions, rocks they have to get through. It's incredibly difficult. So think about as you're walking up the brook, the journey that these fish are going on. This area is uh, affectionately known to us as Goldilocks Falls, because as you can see, there's not a whole lot of water going over those rocks right now, and that's why all the fish are stuck right there. So they need to have the water level in the main stem of the river, the Brazumscot, to come down low enough so they can get over the falls at the head of tide. Then they can scurry all the way up here, and then they get stuck here waiting for rain. So these guys are gonna be sitting here uh, basically until we get a lot more rain uh, to go up the last push to get up to Highland Lake. This population of fish, Highland Wake gets between 30 and 80,000 alewives per year that go into it. That can never be sustained as a population in the lake because the lake is small. They're able to use the energy from the ocean uh, and then spawn in the lake. And then when the fish come out, they spawn a few weeks later to several months later, the small juveniles go back downstream. So they're bringing massive amounts of ocean, uh, basically calories and nutrients into these freshwater systems as a supplement. And so it's a really important life cycle and event that happens around here that didn't happen for about 250 years because of the dams. So we're very lucky to live in a time when this is back. The range of alewives are from uh, very north in Newfoundland down to the St. John's River in Florida, which is an amazing range, not only geographically, but also temperatures. What's really cool at alewives is they can live in a lot of different um, temperatures, ocean driver conditions, uh, which means that they're probably gonna do well uh, with climate change because they can deal with warmer temperatures than say Atlantic salmon. They also, also overlap with the range. Uh, but I'm gonna catch a couple fish real quick and uh, show you some, so I'll be right back. So this is what brought us all here today. These are alewives. So most of the fish 
uh, mature at four years old. So most of these fish are four years old. Some of the more precocious ones spawn for the first time at three years old. But like I said, they can repeat spawn. So if you get a five, six, seven year old, you know that it spawned multiple times. You can confirm that look at the scales. So we sample uh, 25 fish each time we're here, roughly. So you can see how the sex ratio changes throughout the run, how the demographic changes, whether it's older, healthier fish first, younger, healthier fish second. Uh, these are all things we're learning about. Alewives are called alewives because of their shape. It's the traditional name for innkeepers in England. So being very beer belly forward. Uh, their scientific name is Pseudo Alosa Pseudo Harangus. Alosa means river herring. Pseudo Harangus means they're herring like. Uh, blueback herring are Alosa ice develus, which means they're the spring herring. Uh, so you can see the scales come off really easily, they get on everything. And this one, I give it a little pinch, that sperm coming out, so you know this is a male. One of the indicating things about alewives compared to blueback herring is they are deeper bodied, and both of them have this spot right behind their gill plate. The more slender, smaller ones are typically males. This is a female. If you look really close, you can see those are eggs. So when they're red like that, it means uh, they're not quite fully developed yet, so they'll probably develop in another week or two, and they'll become larger and more orange, kind of like my coat color. Uh, another nickname for them is saw bellies, uh, because if you, kind of like a shark, if uh, you rub your finger the wrong way, it'll cut your finger. They have a pretty high oxygen need compared to some other fish, and so while it's, uh, it's brutal to them to catch them on their spawning run, uh, they expire very quickly. Uh, so they're not in pain for very long. What's really important about that is that they provide an amazing cover for other fish that live in this brook. Imagine how safe you would feel as a brook trout that lives here when finally, oh, these guys show up to give you some cover from the minks, the otters, the raccoons, everything that's here. From the fishermen that are trying to catch the, the trout, they're not gonna bother trying to fish now because there's too many alewives in the way. Importantly, the same time that alewives come up, late April, um, May, early June, is the same time that Atlantic salmon smolts, so juvenile Atlantic salmon, move down to the ocean. So Atlantic salmon live in the river um, for a few years until they get to smolt size, it's called, which is when they start to owl migrate towards the ocean. It's at the same time the alewives are coming up. And so it's a great cover from predators that the salmon, when they're getting out of their haunts, out of under the rocks, acting like trout, when they start moving down the river, they have camouflage, basically, from all these other fish that are gonna get eaten uh, before they do. You'll see they don't have any teeth. They eat plankton. Um, they're ram feeders, which means they just open their mouths and swim into things. It's like a bass that has, when a bass opens his mouth, it creates negative pressure that sucks in water. These guys don't. They just open their mouth and uh, ram things uh, down their throat. As you can see, the, um, the bony bits on the, in the front of their gills, that's what catches the plankton. Uh, they eat a lot of copepods and things. One of the biggest sources of mortality for these from humans uh, <clears throat> is bycatch. Shiny, silvery, lives in the ocean. What else is shiny, silvery, lives in the ocean? Atlantic herring. There's a big fishery for Atlantic herring, and these guys swim a lot of times with Atlantic herring. If you catch, 100, 200 tons of herring, uh, which can happen with some of the boats, uh, and you get 50,000 alewives, you would never even know because they look so similar. Um, and they get brought onto the boat with what's called a fish pump, so people aren't even ha handling them. And so it's really difficult to know when you're going to bycatch herring, uh, river herring. Um, so that's one of the major sources of mortality that there's been a lot of work in fishes management circles to try to remedy some of that. Hi everybody, I'm Aaron once again, work at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and I'm gonna to talk to you today about environmental DNA. So environmental DNA is kind of like uh, forensics for fish. And so what we're doing, and we're, I, like to, we, I like to explain it as, as we're, as humans we're shedding off hair, skin, hair cells, skin cells, all of those things are in our environment. So if I was to take a sample of air, I would have a lot of human DNA in there, as well as birds and other different, like probably some squirrels. And so what we're doing that is we're applying that same concept to fish. And so we're getting a sample of water, and in that water sample are parts that are fish is kind of left behind. So think of like skin cells, mucus, 
um, some fecal matter, some urine, it's all in the water. And we can get a sample of that water and then we can filter it down and it ends up on a little disc. And on that disc contains all of the DNA that was in that water. You can ask kind of two different questions. One question is with like qPCR, which is to look at relative abundance. So basically for that one single species. So we could get that water sample and we can say, uh, the water sample in April had a very low amount of DNA for alewives, but the sample that we're taking right now has lit up with DNA from alewives. So we can kind of track the way that the alewives are moving up with those water samples as they're kind of moving through. And so another way that we can do it is called metabarcoding. And what that does is it gives us a diversity of species. So if you think of it as like a, a pie that's available in that water. And so the amount of DNA that's on that pie, and you can divide it between the different species and the amount of different DNA that's in there. So you, right now that, that, that pie would be a lot of alewife DNA, but there could also be some blueback DNA in there. And there could also be some like trout DNA, but those would be little like smaller sl slivers of that pie. Well, it doesn't give you a relative true abundance. It gives you an estimate of what that uh, community is, looks like. So you could be like, okay, that has a lot of different fish in it, but it's a majority is alewife. You can use eDNA e in those ways, and it really just depends on what the question is that you're asking on how you kind of proceed with it. One cool thing about what GMRI is doing right now and with eDNA and the advancements of it, is we actually have an eDNA lab kind of up and running at GMRI so we can process our own samples. And what we're looking at is we're looking at that relative abundance question. And so what we're doing here on the river is we're taking the water samples that throughout the whole entire run so we can try to get an idea of what it looks like um, for DNA and therefore what it looks like for the run. So we can tell the peaks um, and we can tell the valleys and when they're, when they're going. We continue doing it throughout after the run is over. And so we'll actually see a spike back up um, when the juveniles are running back out. And so it's harder to actually count those juveniles as they're making their way back downstream. But with DNA, you can capture that movement. So it's really kind of a cool up and coming technology that um, has really is trying, starting to be a little bit more defined in the areas that we're working on. So what Sam's doing now is she's taking the temperature of the water. So we're trying to get an idea of what's going on with the run and the temperatures that it's going on along with it. See if that has a factor kind of in their movements, um, which we think it does. And what she'll do after she takes the temperature is she'll take um, the cap off and then she'll take a sample of water, swish it around and then dump it out. And so that way it makes sure that there, if there was anything in that container of water, that it's kind of rinsed out with the water that's in the environment. And so you're not getting any cross contamination. That's one of the biggest thing for eDNA is contamination factors. So we really wanna make sure that what we're taking for a water sample is what's actually in the water. We do that before the run starts. So that way we can kind of get a ground kind of base level and so we not only do it here up at these, up at, up at Mill Brook, but we do it down at Presumpscott Falls too. It's that kind of major first barrier for them to get up. So we take water samples below the falls and we take water samples above the falls and we can really try to get an idea of when that migration kind of happens. A really cool thing about eDNA and taking water samples is that anybody can do it. So you don't have to have um, a science background. So it's a really good community science tool. So that way, even if we're not going to the, if we're not going all the time, other people can grab those water samples for us, give us the filters that come out of it, and then we can get a, an even better idea of what's going on. And then we're also using it in comparison with our other sea bass projects. So we're looking at beach stains. And so when I was talking about, we look for juvenile air life when they come out of the system, we're catching those in our beach stains, which a beach stain is basically a, a large net, it's about 150 feet. And what we're doing is we're deploying it off of a boat. And so we have um, three to four people on a boat and we drive up to the beach, drop one person off with one end of the net, we make a big U with the boat, and then we drop the other person off, and what you haul in are all the juvenile fish that were in that area. And so we get an understanding of what's going on in Casco Bay with, with that sample, and we're taking eDNA samples along with it, so when we know that there's juvenile alewives, and our eDNA is saying there's juvenile alewives, it's a good like, corroboration. And we always like to validate what we're doing and making sure we understand the technology. And since it's such a newer technology, um, it's even more important to understand how it works in the environment. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you Aaron and Zach for their amazing talks. They're, they're so awesome. So enthusiastic and passionate about fish. Um, it's the best. It's contagious. Thank you all for coming out this morning. It's really valuable for the Land Trust to have such great interest in the various programming that we do throughout the year. 
If you're not a member of the Land Trust, I would strongly encourage you to join us. None of this would be possible without donations from individuals, support from businesses, and grants that we get through the various community sources. But please consider joining the Land Trust. There's no fixed dues or any specific dollar amount. Any contribution that you make helps support our efforts and allows us to continue to do this great work. So thank you very much.